All right, hello everybody. Today is Thursday, which means it's an Ask Me Anything for the CrossFit Lynchpin private Facebook group, where every Thursday we post, um, you know, we put out the AMA call for action, and members throw out questions, and the ones that get the most upvotes get answered. So here we go. This one, Colin Jacobson, you won this morning, most upvotes. Here's your question. I'll read it in its entirety, and then I'll answer it. With the growing size of our group, do you have concerns around overexpansion and the ability to effectively manage and engage the community, or do you believe the more people you can get into the sport in the right way, the better? Secondly, do you miss or wish you had the ability to directly coach and work with some people in person? Fantastic question. Fantastic. So let me, I'll break it down because there's a couple questions in there. Do I have concerns around the overexpansion and ability to effectively manage the group? No. That's probably the easiest way that I can do it. No. And the only reason that I can say no with confidence, I guess, is there's no signs of that happening yet. You know, I was obviously uh, around from the beginning and had to manage it when it was 10 people, had to manage it when it was 100 people, had to manage it when it was 500 people, had to manage it when it hit 1,000, had to manage it when it hit several thousand. And I think that ability has just grown as the community has grown. And there's a couple key pieces in there. You know, one of them is what I have to do to provide the service that I tell everybody that I will provide them, which, you know, I strive for my goal to be the most fun and effective CrossFit workouts that you can do out there and programming everything from the warm-ups to the workouts to the scales to the limited equipment to the no equipment workouts to the goal times to the videos to, you know, the, the movement videos to the daily explanation videos, the cool down, stretching, you know, all that stuff that takes uh, a set amount of time. It takes a long time. It takes ballpark three weeks to make a four-week block of training. So it's a substantial amount of time. It takes three weeks to make a four-week block of training. And that's just what it takes if I was making it for two people or 2,000 people. Like that's, It just takes three weeks to make a four-week block. Now, the other part that grows is, yes, the, the community and the reach and, you know, the people in the, in the private track Facebook group and all that stuff. And thus far, everything has been going profoundly well, incredibly well. And I would love to stand up here and say that there is some genius way that I'm, I'm making that happen. But that would be a bold-faced lie. I really don't think that that's it. I, I cannot take credit, quite frankly, for what the community has become. I couldn't be happier, quite frankly, but I can't take credit for it. The community is its own entity, its own living thing. I mean, we've got thousands of members now, and I don't know how we pulled this off and not the numbers. What I mean is I don't know how we got so many of the right people in one place. And I wouldn't care if, if that was 100 people or 10,000 people. They have to be the right people. And we've got somehow, whether it worked out well, whether it was luck, whether it was intentional planning, whether it was a mixture of both, the people that we have in the linchpin community make managing the linchpin community far easier than it ever should be to probably manage a group of this size. And, you know, this is just the God's honest truth and all of you are in the community, so you know that I'm not lying when I say this. Maybe somebody who watches this on YouTube or when I make it into a podcast will be like, oh yeah, here we go. Bit of a sales pitch, we know. Linchpin's great, blah, blah, blah. But you all are in that private Facebook group and in all of this. You know that it's true. 
the people in there are in they're kind first of all first and foremost they're kind they're kind to each other in a way that restores my hope in humanity because we truly are a global community from all around the world all different ability levels you know every race creed color political view gender i don't care you name it they're in the group they're all in the group there's the differences of the people in the group are vast the singular uniting common thread is crossfit is a desire to go into the gym every day to sweat to get after it and to try to live a, a healthier more productive life whether it's for your work your family your kids your health whatever it happens to be and that common goal unifies the entire group in a way that boggles my mind it is full of support and kindness and the group is intelligent that's another thing on top of being kind they're intelligent and that to some degree makes my job easier now you know i try to put out as much content as i possibly can and be an open book about my knowledge and experience because it is my thought that a more well educated group is better for everybody it's better for the individual user it's better for me you know the smarter that the group is they know how to take care of things and we've got level you know, we've got a ton of level 1 trainers in the group a ton of level 2 trainers in the group we have people who have obtained their crossfit level 3 credential which by the way is no joke we've got a bunch of affiliate owners that run gyms full time in the group got an incredible diverse group people who come from powerlifting backgrounds olympic lifting backgrounds um distance running the whole 9 yards and now if somebody posts you know a question about well hey i saw this uh, about the bergner warm or her, when should i do the accessory work or what's the perspective on this or, you know you name the question and that's the benefit of having a smart kind respectful supportive group is by the time you know i might be doing some computer work a few hours later i check back into the facebook group do a scan see how things are going and i'll see a question that was posted and there'll be three or four members that answered it beautifully beautifully and not with any ego or arrogance they'll be like hey you know this is just my opinion i found that this works for me here's what it is and and half the time i just write a little comment that i'm like yep 100% agree or you know or I click like i mean so i have to say the community that we have developed makes it possible for me to do what i do like it's it's it boggles my mind and i have to keep bragging you guys for a second it's somehow we've also created an amazingly safe space which i know that can be a bit of a buzzword in 2020 but i mean it for exactly what it is cuz people have literally posted that they're like hey i'm going to i'm going to share this with the group because i know that this is a safe place to do it and so people have felt comfortable opening up being transparent being vulnerable and you know laying their cards on the table and truly asking for help in certain areas if they need it or truly feeling comfortable saying hey i'm really confused about this i've never understood it can somebody help me out uh, the level of pride that that fills me with is more than somebody pr on a workout really i mean because a community is what helps propel you forward in the world i don't care if it's in business and education whatever it is physical fitness you know it it takes a community and it takes the right community <clears throat> and somehow we've got it so that is that is why uh Colin I can honestly say at this point in time I don't have any concerns my concerns not to mess it up because you all are crushing it you know so we're going to keep doing what we're doing second part of your question was do i miss some in person stuff sure yeah uh, you know absolutely 
you know, there's so many aspects. There's so many aspects to CrossFit. There's so many aspects to running a gym that, you know, you can't have it all. You know, you can't have it all. And, and, and there are, there would be, there's some great rewards to tuning up somebody's air squat or helping them finally feel what the hips opening up feels like on the push jerk or something like that. You know, and, and there's, there's rewards in every facet of, of CrossFit, CrossFit training and running a community. And yeah, I mean, for sure, some of those are fantastic. And, but luckily what we have created brings me such overwhelming pride and joy that what I do miss, I'm good to go with. I'm good to go with. So um, I do feel uh, very lucky to have all of you as the community in my life. It's, it, uh, it is my top priority in this entire world, next to my family, of course, of cultivating and assisting the linchpin community. That is my maniacal daily from the moment I get up to the moment I go to bed focus it's and we'll and we'll keep doing it okay Chris had a a question that won't take me long to answer um Chris Comfer what are the odds there will be a zombie apocalypse t-shirt coming up before Halloween none I apologize I wish that was the case but there's been a lot going on and as cool as that shirt would be uh, it just fell a little bit further down the list of priorities. I haven't got to it yet. I it won't. It won't be here by Halloween. And for anybody who is watching and they're not quite sure what I mean when I say zombie apocalypse, the zombie apocalypse crew is our loving name for our limited equipment option crew. So our limited equipment option is the individuals that don't have barbells. They've just got dumbbells, pull-up bar, set of gymnastics rings, and a jump rope, and that's it. And they are rugged individuals. If you live your life every day with dumbbells, you're tough. You're tough, you're dedicated, and you're fit. I'll tell you that much. So since they're so darn tough, we love them. We call them the zombie apocalypse team. And that's our limited equipment option. If you take the first word out of limited equipment and option, it's L-E-O. So I know it's also some people new to the community We'll see Leo posted every now and then. Somebody will say, oh, I'm going to join the Leo crew, or I hit the Leo today. I'm going to do the Leo, whatever it happens to be. And when they say Leo, they're talking limited equipment option. They're talking the dumbbell track. And somebody also asked a question, didn't get a lot of upvotes, but it was for the limited equipment option, would I consider putting in like empty barbell thrusters in place of wall balls um, or something like that? And, and the answer to that is they don't have a barbell. And the limited equipment crew just has, you know, they may have more, but we assume they only have a pair of dumbbells that pull up bar bolted to the wall, a pair of gymnastics rings hung from the pull up bar, so they're low, they're not even hung from the ceiling. Maybe you've got a low height in your apartment, garage, or whatever, and the jump rope. That's it, that little modest amount of gear, and they crush it every single day. But I will have to get on that shirt because it's come up several times. <laughs> All right, let's see. Matt had a question. Matt Stotts, here we go. When you program seven by one of something, for example, on a heavy day, should that be treated as building to a one rep max? When I look at the leaderboard, I'm always shocked to see how much is written for the first rep. Follow up to say, let's say you fail set number five, should you drop the weight and just finish all the sets? Great question. And Chris mentioned below it that you said, hey, Pat usually addresses this in the videos for the daily program, which is true. So a quick plug there, make sure you watch the daily video that accompanies each workout. I try to pack them with, with as much useful information as possible so you can make the best decisions possible. But it's a great question, so we'll hit it up here for sure. Uh, let me get back to it. Let's see. Should it be treated as building to a one rep max or taking a seven by one day? Yes and no, and I know that might be an unsatisfying answer at first. A seven by one day of back squat, deadlift, clean and jerk, you name it. The goal that day is just to lift heavy. Whatever heavy single feels like that day. And because it's a heavy single, 
you are going to ideally work up to a loading that there's no way that you would see in a mixed modality workout, a two or three or four round workout that has other things in it, because it'd be far too darn heavy. When you really work up and you hit a single, you need to rest two to four minutes before you can do that next single, two to four minutes before you can do that next single. So, I mean, the weight is obviously far too heavy that you could put into a workout. So on this day, the goal is to expose yourself to a very heavy loading that you can safely manage for that particular day. I would liken these days in some degree to like a 10 by 100 meter sprint day. So yes, we deadlift in other workouts, but not like we do in a seven by one day. We run in other workouts for sure, but on a 10 by 100 meter dash day, since it's just that with nice periods of rest in between each sprint, you are going to be able to run at a pace that you would never run in a workout. And therefore, you are exposing yourself to a unique stimulus that's, that's specific to that day that you don't find in a mixed modality workout. Kind of the same mindset on the 7 by one So what heavy means to each person is different on any particular day. So you're going to lift what's heavy for you that day. And heavy comes into play on a seven by one day, you know, and I say this in the videos, what the weight you start at, you could look at a classic lifting chart and it will tell you, okay, you're gonna do singles, you're gonna do this many singles, you know, a beginner, an intermediate, or an expert lifter would be in this ballpark percentage range, every one rep max, et cetera, et cetera. Those are useful metrics, but also what lifting charts don't know is they don't know some critical data on you. They don't know that you've got a newborn baby in the house and you haven't slept in two weeks. That lifting chart is now literally trash. They don't know that you travel for work, you've been sleeping in hotels, you're jet lagged, time zones are messed up, and you've been living out of airport food. They don't know that. They don't know what the last two or three days workouts have been and how your body reacted to those workouts. They don't know a whole bunch of information if you're stressed out at work. That is absolutely mission critical to how your lifting day will be. So, you know, we provide the lifting chart information you know, based upon the more likely percentage or the super fitness robot percentage. But then we always, always say this caveat of you've got to listen to your body. You've got to listen to your body during the warm up and then make the best decision during your warm up based upon how you feel that day as to where you're going to start those working sets, right? So you do your general warm-up, your head-to-toe warm-up, then you do some warm-up sets for whatever the lift happens to be, and then once you've adequately adequately warmed up that particular lift to get into the neighborhood of what those the first of that 7 by one will be, then you start your working sets for that lift. And heavy is a relative thing based upon all the factors that I just said. So some days, I'm talking about how to attack the 7 by one if you feel great, you feel fantastic, you can absolutely use one of those 7 by one days to establish a new one rep max for sure, feel free. But maybe you're not feeling it. The last few days have been tough on you. Sleep has been a bit, a bit neglected, whatever it happens to be. Well, then you're like, I'm not even going to be in the neighborhood of a new PR today. That's totally fine because heavy is based upon all those factors that we just mentioned. Heavy is unique each day. And if maybe the last time you pulled a seven by one, all the stars aligned to your sleep, your nutrition, your stress levels, I mean, all of it, well, you're living a different week this week. So you just lift heavy based upon how you feel this week. And that might be 10% below all your lifts last time, could be 20%, you're not quite sure. The other phrase I use to describe how the working sets should be, again, is probably very unsatisfying, but true. I say that they should be, your working sets should be appropriately challenging. And appropriately challenging means the appropriate part is, if it was inappropriate, that means you're lifting beyond your means and you're compromising your form or your technique. That's inappropriate. We do not want that to happen. Appropriately challenging. So they still need to be challenging because if you're not challenging your body, well, then you're not stressing it enough to get that, that adaptation from exposing yourself to that stimulus. So it needs to be appropriate, 
and it needs to be challenging. And what is appropriately challenging is unique to each individual for all of the factors that I just mentioned. So you are going to lift on that 7 by one day whatever is appropriately challenging for you on that day. Could be a one rep, could not be a one rep. Um, let's see. Okay, so as you say, let's follow up to that and say that you fail set number five. Should you then drop the weight and finish all the sets? So that also leads into, do you have to hold the same weight across all seven singles, or can you go up and down? Once again, yes to both. Holding a very high percentage of your one rep max across all singles is profoundly demanding and probably something that more a little bit of, a, of an advanced veteran lifter would do. In going up and going down a little bit or slowly building, you know, so that sets five, six, and seven are potentially some of your best, um, is maybe a more welcoming way to do it for a, a lot of people. Now, whichever of those two paths that you choose, again, if you're counting them as your working sets and not your warm-up sets, they need to be appropriately challenging. And so even if you're starting, quote-unquote, a bit lighter on set number one, because you're going to build up over the course of seven and generally increase it by five pounds, you know, a rep or something like that, even that first one should be appropriately challenging. Without question, you're going to get it but it's still appropriately challenging. So you can go up, you can go down, as long as they're challenging. Uh, now let's say that you fail rep number five. Do you count it? Do you move on? Do you drop the weight? All those things are largely individual to the lifter. There's not a black and white, you have to do this, or you didn't do the seven by one day properly rule. You know, if you pull, let's say you're doing a deadlift, and you pull rep number five and you get it, to right around your knees and there's a like a uh, two second struggle there and you don't get it you decide to drop the weight you drop the weight should you count that fail quote unquote failure and move on should you lot lower the weight and redo it again either one's okay there's no way that you could lift something so heavy to your knee ideally not compromising your form struggle with it there for a couple seconds and not have just a cascade of hormones going through your body and your central nervous system just peaked. You're doing hard, serious, beneficial work, even on that missed lift. So I wouldn't have any drama with somebody just counting that. Put it in a note in the, you know, in your Beyond the Whiteboard app, it's got a note section. Say what happened on rep five. Um, if you still feel good and that didn't tax you too much, There'd be nothing wrong also with, you know, taking adequate rest and lowering the weight and attempting to redo rep number five. Either one's good to go. But if a fail happened, whether you're going to count it or not, you didn't get the loading up. So it would certainly be my recommendation to lower the loading and finish out the workout at a slightly lower loading that is still challenging, yet you can safely move. And I think you'll be, you'll be good to go. Okay, I think that was... Uh, that was that. Jackson Taylor had the next question. Let me see. Let me scroll around, see if I can find Jackson here. Jackson, where are you? Where are you, sir? Here we go. Okay. What's the best way... I'm going to keep myself on track. What's the best way for us training alone to dial in technique for more complicated movements meaning without access to in-person coaching or immediate feedback? Excellent question. So, here we go. First of all, like I said, uh, previously, I believe in Colin's question, the first question can lean on this group. I mean, people will post videos of themselves doing movements and ask for feedback. And again, I love the group. They have intelligence, right? I mean, so you realize you're asking a large group of people for for instruction, it's up to you as to whether or not you take that instruction, right? <laughs> but there's plenty of wonderful, competent people that can give you uh, great instruction if you ask for it. So you can feel free, uh, you know, to do that. And again, it's it's up to you as to whether or not you decide to take that. But also, I know we're in the pandemic at the moment, but it's money well spent if you've got a local coach and maybe you train alone in your garage, and once a month, once a quarter, once whenever, you 
have a, a local coach in the area that's well known or respected and you compensate them for an hour of their time for personal one-on-one -on -one training and in an hour of their time they you know watch you do several of your lifts give you on the spot great feedback it's money very well spent very well spent but let's say that you can't do that there are still ways to make this happen you can self you can self coach people have done it all the time and it works it just takes a little bit of effort so all you need to do i mean you name the lift you name the movement snatch clean and jerk deadlift front squat handstand walking ring muscle ups it doesn't matter there are amazing instructive videos on YouTube. YouTube can be a dumpster fire. YouTube can be an amazing repository of information. So we can use it for the good part of that. So you can find whatever you need with beautiful points of performance there in regular speed, slow motion. You can pause it in every frame, the whole nine yards. Then everyone's got a smartphone, right? Get yourself a little tripod, a little something, and just film yourself doing whatever the movement is that you happen to be struggling with in the same frame in the same angle as the video that you found online regular speed and slow motion and then all you need to do upload that to your laptop get those two screens next to each other on your laptop of you moving in slow motion and the you know the wonderful amazing perfect form individual uh, on the other side of the screen and you can just go frame by frame as slow as you want to go, regular speed, slow motion, doesn't matter, and see where does what you're doing differentiate from what that idealized movement is. And then you just correct that fault. And let's say that you find five faults, which you probably will because we do complicated movements. Don't try to fix all five at once. That won't happen. So just identify one of those faults and then try to focus on fixing that one fault. And then go back, whether that's in a week or a month, check out to do the same thing again. And if that one fault has been corrected or significantly improved, then work on the next of the four remaining faults. And if you had the patience to keep playing the game, it's certainly possible. You can improve yourself dramatically with nothing but the internet and your cell phone. People do it uh, all the time. It works like a champ. And it can be done. So that, that can be that. Okay, let's see. <laughs> All right. A fun question from David Nicholson. Here we are. A fun question, but we'll take it, right? What's your favorite way to cook a steak? Cast iron skillet, cooked medium rare for me. Salt, pepper, and garlic. First of all, David, that sounds absolutely delicious. So for me, we cooked some ribeyes the other night, as a matter of fact. We've got a Traeger out back use the Traeger. I've got this rub that I got from the, the butcher shop. We've got a cool butcher in town. I'm out of it, unfortunately, uh, so I need to get more, but I've got a great rub. Put a rub on the steaks, put them on the grill, medium rare, and that's fantastic. I've never used the big green egg. People say that's fantastic. I would love to try that. The cast iron skillet, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued by the cast iron skillet. How does that go? How long do you do it? What's the recipe? Does it stink up the whole house? Um, maybe next Tuesday, you know, we do Tasty Tuesdays in the Lynchman Private Track where we share recipes and food stuff. Maybe on next Tasty Tuesday, David, you can share the cast iron skillet steak recipe because I think I would like to dive on into that. I actually, so now, that you, now that I have that in my head, I have some leftover steak in my fridge right now, which maybe once this video is done and I have to make breakfast, maybe I'll make steak and eggs, and that will be fantastic. Okay, uh, final couple questions here. Jean St. Amon, here we go. What's your prescription for getting better at stringing large sets of wall balls together? I seem to hit my capacity early on a workout like Karen. Great question. My first recommendation is to be about six foot five inches tall. I find that works really well for wall wall shots. No, but in all honesty, when I saw your question, you know what jumped out to me, and I should have written down the the name. We posted it several weeks ago in the group here. It's an old CrossFit Journal article 
from Greg Glassman. No, I think it's from Greg Glassman. And it was how to improve either your 1K or your 2K time on the rower. And it basically had all of these different ways to chop to chop it up. You could take, if you found that article, again, that same mindset and apply it instead of a to a 1,000 or a 2,000 meter row to a set of 100 wall balls or a set of 150 wall balls. And all the different ways of rep schemes, intentional rest periods, and time domains that they use to improve their row, you could use for the wall ball shots as well. Because like everything else, variance is your friend. And that would be things such as, you know, everything from, it was saying you're trying to improve a set of 100 wall balls, you doing a set of 100, noting your time. Now you could just repeatedly do a set of 100 every Monday and Friday or something and hope that over the course of weeks or months, your wall ball capacity got better and then your sets got bigger approaching 100, your time to do 100 went down. But just doing that repeatedly wouldn't be the best way to attack it because again, variance is wonderful. So you could do that. You could do every minute on the minute, 10 wall wall shots, still get yourself to 100, but you're doing it in a different way. And then with that every minute on the minute, <clears throat> it takes ballpark one minute to do 30 wall ball shots. So if you're doing 10 every minute on the minute, that's going to take you about 20 seconds of work and 40 seconds of rest. So you could do that as a baseline metric and see, can you sustain that? Can you do an EMOM 10 minutes of 10 wall ball shots? If you can, then what you can do is next time, be a pain in the butt to manage the time, but you know results don't come easy. Since that's 20 seconds of work and 40 seconds of rest roughly, try to do it as 10 seconds of work and 35 seconds of rest or 30 seconds of rest and see can you sustain that and then you can keep playing that game reducing the rest period until eventually you're linking the sets you could do uh, four sets of 25 reps of wall ball shots with whatever was the minimum acceptable rest period you needed to do four big sets of 25 maybe it's 90 seconds maybe it's two minutes and again slowly reduce that rest period between each set of 25 and by the way you're still doing every now and then the set of 100 straight. You're still doing the 10 minute EMOM. You could do 40, 30, 20, 10 sets of wall balls with small rest or descending rest in between each of those, again, with the goal of slowly reducing that. And then you could do the accessory work that we program, such as dumbbell box step ups, Bulgarian split squats, dumbbell walking lunges, things of that nature. Uh, and attacking it in so many different areas would be, in my opinion, the best way to improve your ability to do wall ball shots. And it's the same way to improve your row, the same way to improve many other things is through variance and through attacking it through many different angles. And last, well, last question, and then we got a fun little thing we're going to do at the end, a new thing. Let's see. So the last question, this didn't get the most upvotes, okay? I know if so I'm deviating from protocol. But I think this is a question that comes up regularly, so I think there's value in just people hearing it because it, it applies to a large range of things. And it's from Matt Williams. Matt, where are you, sir? Here we go. What's the best way to utilize a ski erg for those of us who have one when it is not programmed in most workouts? Okay, great question. And this applies to many pieces of gear, but we'll start with your question for the ski erg. If you've got the ski erg, fantastic awesome. But you're right. Most people don't have it because it's it's not exactly cheap. It's great. And so if people are going to spend money, they're going to accumulate a whole lot of other pieces of gear first before they get the ski erg. And so every time that we program something that has a run or a row in it, which is not infrequent, if you look under all the details provided on the private track, you know, through the Beyond the Whiteboard app, we'll always give you other... Um, options for for example so let's say the work of the day is helen three rounds for time 400 meter run 21 kettlebell swings 12 pull-ups well every time that that comes up or anything that has a run or row or a bike in it will give you the option to do that same workout with any other piece of gear so you could do helen and we'll tell you what distance to do on the concept two bike the concept two rower the echo bike the assault bike or the ski erg for example so anytime that you see a workout that has a bike, a row, uh, or a run, 
look at the details that day, and there's always a ski erg modification in there if you so choose. You should always feel free if you want to go ahead and throw that ski erg in there. And how this has carry over to other people as well is this also applies to things which are cool pieces of gear, but not everybody has, such as axle bars, sandbags, D balls, yokes, you name it. If you know the chief the other day came up, which has uh, you know it's three minute AMRAPs, but it has power cleans with 135 pounds for the gentlemen, 95 pounds for the ladies. I didn't use a barbell that day. I used a, a D ball that I had out in the garage, and I just did ground to over the shoulder. And so if any workout that pops up, if you have a piece of gear that you can mimic the movement with that piece of gear, absolutely feel free to do it. You're still preserving the stimulus, and you're right along with the same flow that everybody else is doing. You're just doing it with a little bit of a different gear, piece of gear, which makes it fun. We want to keep working out fun, and I want everyone to know that you're always authorized to make those decisions. You've got a sandbag, you've got a D-ball, fire it up, throw it into the workout. They're fantastic, they're fun. You've got an axle bar and you want to just make the workout more grippy and challenging? Absolutely. You know, fire up the axle bar, you're good to go. So, you're always authorized to do that. Okay. Final, final thing we're going to do. This week it just, I don't know why, I just started going through the the Facebook page, and it was warming my heart, and so I took some screenshots. I should probably be more dedicated about this because I did it last minute, you know, just starting yesterday, the day before. But here's about a half dozen things that are just, and it's funny, it kind of relates to Colin's question initially as to why our community is so cool. Yeah, I mean, yes, I, I try to have the best programming on the face of the earth, but our community, come on. So here we go. Here's some screenshots I took from the people posting stuff in the Facebook group. Uh, from Clinton Blankenship on the deadlift day. They had five people deadlifting in their garage. And let's see, all five in our group tied or set new deadlift PRs today. And he's bragging on his little brother who pulled 425. Five people in the garage tying or setting new deadlift PRs. Extraordinarily cool. Next one we had, oh, we had 32 members join last week. 32 last week. That's, that's, blows my mind. Okay. No shock to anyone. Ben. Ben G. I don't want to, I don't want to mess up your last name, Ben. I know you're from France. Gobert? Am I messing it up? We all know Ben, the crazy lunatic animal from France. He's very well known in the group. Just eats workouts, devours them. And the other workout, the, the other day when he did the thruster, the running and thruster workout, the light one, 8 minutes and 22 seconds. 8 minutes and 22 seconds. It's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. For his, And he's a big guy, too. Big and strong as he is, he moved that light barbell and ran his tail off incredibly. Oh, this one's great. Jesse Hutchings. So this, again, is on our 7x1 deadlift that came up the other day. So this is the wonderful thing about, you know, be on the whiteboard and comparing your data. So he has the last time that he did the 7 by one deadlift. Uh, he took a screenshot of it and put it next to this week's 7 by one deadlift. And the overall increase over the course of those seven reps is he lifted 525 more pounds over the course of the 7 by one deadlift than he did the first time. Where's my calculator? I mean, so I'm sure you could have went up and went down on some lifts, but five, two, five, divided by seven. That means on average, compared to the last time the seven by one deadlift came up to us doing it this week, on average, each one of his deadlifts increased by 75 pounds. That is absolutely, absolutely crazy to me. Oh, uh, then we had Levi. Levi Atkins, he says that heavy deadlifts days don't treat my back well. About a quarter of the time, I tweak my back if I get much over 350 pounds. He's got a lifetime PR of 500, but he says he injured himself a few years ago. So whenever these days come up, I have to find a way to make them challenging. Today, my back was tight, so I went with 275 pounds 
from a two inch deficit. Fitness was achieved and more importantly I'll still be able to participate in the rest of the week. That post to me from Levi epitomizes what I just said again. Intelligence, smart decisions, understanding the stimulus and not letting your ego get in the way and realizing that scaling or modifying the workout is this, the this best thing that you can do. Because yes, fitness was still achieved. He still deadlifted off the floor that day, but he did it in a way that was smart. And he did it in a way that will allow him to continue working out for the rest of the weeks and months and years coming with a happy, healthy, and strong body. Those posts fire me up. I absolutely love them. And that is like what I was saying, again, back to Colin's question, the linchpin community, it just, it just makes it easy. It makes it easy to manage. Smart people are easy to manage. And, and these are the same people making smart decisions, helping out the newer members in the group. So the, the community starts to have this snowball effect of, of intelligence, of how to scale, of getting your ego out of the way. I mean, it's, it's it's crazy. Uh, two more. Lisa Marie. This one I thought was awesome. So she posted a great video. She's in her garage. She's deadlifting. Her little boy is like standing on a box and he's got like the gymnastics rings in his hands just watching her deadlift, which I love. My kids love playing with the rings as well. And she says, it's been almost two years since I deadlifted 275 pounds, but I did it this morning and tagged another member, thanks Eric John, for the push to lift all the heavy things. That, that makes me so happy to have strong, capable people roaming the face of the earth. And what an amazing example. She's there deadlifting with a little boy watching her. Like that example that's being set as to what you do to lift, uh, excuse me, to live a heavy life, uh, what you do to live a healthy life, it just, again, I sound like a broken record, but it, it, it fills me with pride. And this is why, I mean, this is why linchpin is my passion. This is why I do what I do. And this is why um, I've got no regrets from our amazing, our amazing community. And the last one, super cool. Mauricio Bustamante, a new member, says, Well, I just wanted to say that my trial month is over and I'm definitely staying. Great community, awesome workouts, and fitness all around. Loving this. And that's the goal. That's the goal, is we want to make everybody feel welcome to help them out and to positively and correctly impact as many people around the world as we can. And so far, we're doing it. And I say that we're doing it because it's not just me by a darn long shot. All of you out there in the linchpin community are doing it right and spreading the word that's why we've had the growth that we've had. It's not some magic thing that I'm doing. I'm here to tell you it is from the community. So as always, many thanks. That's all I can say. I'm I'm honored to be a part of it. I'm honored to help and to try to guide the community. We'll keep doing this. And yeah, I'm going to go get some breakfast. (laughs) I hope everybody has a great day. Enjoy your rest day. And we will talk later.